for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord. Dear friends, will you please stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel? On this Transfiguration Sunday, the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. From chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, Matthew writes, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly, A bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud, a voice. This is my son, the beloved. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Dear friends, this is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, will you join me in a word of prayer, everyone? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, let our hearts again today be good soil, open to the seed of your word. As your disciples grow in us the kingdom of God, so that we will be nourished by our faith in you and be nourishment to the world you so love. In the name of Christ Jesus, we live and pray. Amen. Well, I will admit uh, that I have always thought that this particular gospel reading today that we just heard is a kind of a hard to understand gospel, to be honest, Jesus' transfiguration. We just, we don't have anything to compare it to. I mean, I suppose we could say the same for Easter too, huh? We don't have, we don't have resurrection to compare it to, but this one is just unique. So we have to see its purpose today And that's what we're going to do. And and then let that be spiritual. Let it kind of sit in us and do things to us, faith things. And then let it be what draws us deeper into faith's role in our lives and how it plays itself out daily. So we do have to see ourselves today as Peter, James, and John in this narrative. Because we, like them, are Jesus' disciples right now in this world. So, I hope I can take you there in some small but meaningful and relevant way today, okay? This is where we're going to go. So, first of all, complete this sentence for me. What happens in Vegas? Man, that is, every single one of you knew that. (laughs) That has been one of the most effective ad campaigns ever. Of course, this one is provocative, (laughs) for sure, but the provocative is around secrets and illicit things. It's catchy, it's memorable, it's also very edgy. It's about Sin City, right? For Jesus' disciples, the mountaintop experience that they had is the very opposite of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens on the mountaintop for the disciples does not stay on the mountaintop. They are at the height of their experience with their Lord and God does reveal to them that Jesus is his son and that he is the Messiah that Israel had been told to look for and that Jesus is the Lord of their lives, not just there on the mountaintop. And they want to stay 
up in that spot. Right, rightly so. In fact, it's probably a, we've got to find a way to bottle this <laughs> feeling and moment kind of a thing. Last summer, this past summer, my oldest child was married. And that day and night was just magical. It was really, truly a tonight all is right with the world <laughs> kind of a feeling and experience. But by the next day, our friends all left for home, for their homes. The bride and the groom were no longer in extravagant dress. The carriage had turned back into a pumpkin. Isn't that the way this works? And life went on for all of us. Have you ever had that experience, that whole experience? Of course you have. From the mountaintop, right back down into real life the very next day, just hours later. But, and here is the key, none of our lives was the same after that. Not a one. The kids were married. We carried with us a joy and a fulfillment that will change us forever. We now have a son-in-law that we just love in our family. We have their life together to celebrate and to enjoy and to look forward to. Our family has grown and countless new things will come from this mountaintop experience. None of that, though, stayed up there on the mountaintop, did it? It couldn't. In fact, it got to come home with us. And it has changed our outlook on life going forward. For the disciples on that mountaintop, this is exactly the same sort of thing that happened to them. Is it all roses after we leave the mountaintop and come back down into the city or into the valleys of life or just the flat plain of our everyday routines? Of course not. Do we even have to face pain and perhaps suffering and confusion about life or the future often? We do. But are we able to face everything that is ahead of each one of us with a different sort of faith or courage or hope after we have experienced a life-changing thing like meeting God face to face and seeing his glory, his powerful love. Or in feeling Christ's body being pressed down into the palms of our hands. And feeling his blood warm our throats as we drink wine. He has told us is his very lifeblood and hearing him say, this is my body and blood given and shed for you. Or, perhaps, in sitting with friends from church or maybe some new friends that we've just made from some other church at a place like Luther Crest Bible Camp and realizing as you are singing songs at the tops of your lungs that over time God has had brought you there and had ignited your faith to see how good and crucial believing in God really is. Doesn't life look wholly different after times like these? Let that sink into your spirit. Doesn't life look wholly different after times with God like these? The goodness we experience with God cannot stay back in those moments, but it has to and gets to go with us into every part of our regular lives because we can't unsee what we've seen of God. And we can't unexperience what we've experienced of a forgiveness, say, or a love that you feel, or a joy that is promised, that goes beyond what we could only manufacture by ourselves without God. I hope I can take you to a place today of understanding that you have whole files full of seeds that God has planted inside of you of living in God's kingdom, meaning seeing life through God's eyes, 
rather than through eyes that look at the world and look at life without factoring God or your Savior into those images. And that you cannot unsee what God has promised to you and to me. Here, we do have a significant advantage over those first disciples. <laughs> On the way down from their great mountaintop experience, Jesus said those famous words, Tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man has been raised. They had no idea at that point. Now, one iota of an idea at that point that Jesus' crucifixion on the cross, which he had talked about with them, would not be the end of everything. They thought it would. They had no idea that the crucifixion would not be the end of everything. And they had no idea what resurrection was. Not one bit. They had no idea that this, that, changes everything. We do, though. <laughs> Significant advantage over the first disciples. They had to wait to see the full picture of who their Messiah was in their lives for a while yet. We, though, have heard and have experienced the whole picture for as long as we have been in church. <laughs> and for as long as we have gotten to have faith and been able to experience it with each other. Do you remember what the gospel is. Somebody said that to you. What's the gospel? What, what's the good news? Remember what it is? Many people say, well, the gospel is Jesus died for your sins. That's only part of it, though. The gospel, the core of the good news message of God in the Bible is Jesus is raised from the dead. <laughs> That's the gospel. The life-changing news the disciples needed to wait for, but that we have known all along, is Jesus is raised after death. Nothing that dies with God is the end of things. Not one thing. Life rises from death. And we know this. Jesus rises from death. Jesus conquers death's seeming power to end all life-giving things. Jesus takes our sins, your fears, your confusions, and everything that overwhelms us in the evil of life and carries it right with him into the grave. And he puts all of that deadening stuff to its death there. And then tells us that he makes all things new, all life-giving things new when he rises. He makes sinful people new. Each day by forgiveness and in our baptisms. How does this change your life when you think about how you deal with other people from day to day? He looks you in the eyes as the resurrected Lord, just like he looked the disciples in the eyes after he rose, and he says, do not be afraid. I'm with you. I'm with you. How does this help you carry yourself differently every day? He says to people like Peter, which means you and me also, Peter, do you know I love you? Jan, Grant, Thomas, Olivia, Mark, Every single one of you, you know Jesus loves you? How does knowing and putting your faith in this change the way you look at God and people and how you deal with them? He says after his resurrection, I'm going on ahead of you, and I will meet you there. How does hearing this, that Christ beckons you forward to put your faith fully in him meeting you in every moment of your future no matter what is going on how does that change the way you look at life both the best of times and the hardest of times in every regular time in between what happens on the mountaintop 
of meeting Jesus, of putting our faith in him, of living our lives with God in them versus not knowing God, doesn't just happen or stay on some momentary mountaintop. But it goes with us ever after because we've been changed by Christ. And our faith in his death to all things deadening, in his resurrection over all those things, makes all the difference in the world for us. For us and for the world because of him and because of us too, carrying that faith into the world. You have been nourished over and over and over again by Jesus' whole life and death and resurrection. You will again specifically in just a little bit at the Lord's table today as well. And your life will thrive all the more because more seeds of faith and more seeds of God's vision will be planted and start growing in you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, let our hearts again today be good soil, open to the seed of your word. As your disciples grow in us the kingdom of God, so that we will be nourished by our faith in you and be nourishment to the world you so love. In the name of Christ Jesus, the crucified and resurrected Lord, we live and pray. Amen.